Everybody get, uh, get the cobwebs out, everybody get moving a little bit, sit back into the chair, relax. How, was, how do you like this room? Does this room just like kick ass? I love this venue, I love being here. Get off the strip a little bit, get out of the insanity, get out of the uh, craziness, and get uh, get to the business, right? That's what I love about this room, this room is focused on, on the business. So, yeah, that was Megan Trainer's song, No. And, and it's, it's my theme song, and I'll tell you why. Every single dollar that I make in sales is because other guys and other gals can't deal with being told no. We are programmed at a DNA level to just avoid rejection at all costs. And so, um, you know, it's, and people wonder, gosh, you know, some people say, oh, if uh, every no gets you closer to a yes. No, that's not what the no's about. We're actually getting paid for going to a door, going to a kitchen table, talking to a customer or a prospect, and being able to deal with the fact that the odds are, most of the time, you may get a no. When you're on the doors, you're talking seven to one, 10 to one, 15 to one, you're gonna get 15 no's for every yes. Well, people on my team that are out there talking to folks in the neighborhoods, um, they'll have a bad day, things will be going just crappy. They'll be going just bad. And uh, they'll say, you know what? It's over. <laughs> We're not going to get any more yeses. It's over. It's not going to happen anymore. And so they'll say, you know what? Let's see how many no's we can really get before we get an appointment. And about the max that they can get is about 15 in a neighborhood. So it's the day that you wake up and you understand why does sales in general and then solar sales on steroids pay like a really, really weird amount of money. And people think that it's for being able to spend an hour and a half with someone and being able to get them to say yes. It is absolutely not what the money's for. <laughs> the money's for being able to talk to 14 people who said no to get to the one person that said yes and not getting blown out of the saddle. So the way we're going to do that is by monetizing those no's and really realizing what the money is for. And so uh, that's why the title of my book is No Matter What. Um, and the Solar Sales Academy is about uh, teaching people how to make a seven-figure income in sales. I've been working with uh, Bradley and his team upstairs in the VT Lightspeed Center over the last six months to take what I've learned in about 40 years of sales and, and millions and millions and millions of watts worth of solar sold and condense that into a course that's repeatable that we can teach to everybody in an organization. But really what it is, it is an absolute recipe for making seven figures in sales. And if you want the best people in the world to come soul solar for you, then you're gonna have to convince them that yours is the organization they should come to if they're serious about making a million dollars plus a year in sales. Is that possible? It's not just possible, it's probable if you do the work. I belong to an organization that uh, deals with people who are trying to improve themselves and the thing starts out, it says, rarely have we seen a person fail Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Anybody in here recognize that, uh, that, that first sentence to a preamble? <laughs> if you do, come up and tell me about it later. You and I uh, belong to one of the same clubs together. So, uh, But anyway, that's, that's really what we're wanting to do is be able to attract people to our company that uh, is going to create a very successful sales organization. How are we going to do that? By making them believe absolutely believe that by coming to your organization, they're gonna learn how to have a multiple six-figure income on the low side, a seven-figure income on the high side, uh, and then a multiple seven-figure income on the are you kidding me side. I've been able to achieve that for year after year after year after year in solar. The reason I'm standing up here is because when you do that, people come up to you and you say, uh, they say, how do you do that? <laughs> Would you come and talk to us? Uh, we'll pay you $10,000 just to come and spend the day with our sales force. And I've done that about one-tenth of the times that I've been asked to do that. And the reason is, is because I make more than $10,000 a day selling solar. So why would I take myself out of my market and fly to L.A. and spend a day with them and, and show them how to make uh, their sales people to get ahead? So uh, what we've done instead, I've worked with Brad and, and uh, Lee and I have uh, talked about incorporating that, that into this program. 
uh, is how you can, on a program, probable basis, how can you show people how to do this? And the way we're going to do it is by having me train them one-on-one -on, -one on exactly what you need to do every single step of the way. And that's what is now a part of this MOD Sales Academy. It's also part of the book that I have coming out. Both of them won't be available to after Labor Day. Part of uh, Lee's offer is that he has a pre uh, a pre launch access to this program. It's only going to be made available between now and Labor Day to this group. So uh, let me see is this thing. I don't think this thing is advanced. Oh, there it goes. Over which way? Over to you. Okay. So what is this really about? Is this just about going door to door and peddling stuff? We're not going door to door, we're not marketing, we're not on Facebook peddling stuff in the solar industry. We're doing something different. On May 25th, 1961, JFK announced to a special sub, uh, session of Congress that the United States of America was going to put a man on the moon. If you were listening to that speech and you were in that audience in 1961, when you're realizing that, you know, we're driving 57 Chevys around and uh, we, don't even, we don't even have a calculator, let alone a computer, and, and some guy says, we're going to put a man on the moon in less than a decade, what would your thoughts have been? What do you think JFK caught? You think everyone was like, yeah, absolutely, we're going to do it? <laughs> Is that what you think these guys who had to pay for it, the Congress? He's speaking to Congress right there. That's the Speaker of the House, that's the head of the Senate. What do you think they thought as this young guy is saying, hey, we're going to spend the money to put a man on the moon in less than 10 years? And they were clapping in the background. What do you think they were saying behind his back? NFW. NFW. That's what they were saying behind his back. And what happened by July of 1969? Right? We were putting one foot on the moon and we were saying a small step for man, a giant leap for mankind. That happened. That's what happens when the United States of America makes up its mind that something's going to happen. People heard that and they said, NFW, there's no way we don't have the technology, we don't have the money, it'll bankrupt the company. There's no way to get there from here. And yet by July of 1969, we had a man on the moon. So, what uh, is going on that we th would think would be about paramount to that, uh, to that <laughs> same exact situation? We have a new president, don't we? And he just announced to a joint session of Congress, Biden commits the U.S. to cutting emissions by half by 2030. Like, are you kidding me? Is that possible? And what is everybody saying when they hear we're going to cut emissions by 2030. What do they actually have to say about that? NFW. Can't do it, don't have the technology, would bankrupt the country. There's no way to get there from here. And that is what we're dealing with today. People think that we're out peddling. And if you can cue this up, go ahead and play it. This was this Sunday on this week, which is the Sunday program like the Meet the Press. We've been hearing about this since what, you know, 2000, climate change, global warming, blah, 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 blah. It's not true, it's not real. What's really the deal? Dr. Mann, is it too late? No, I mean, that's the good news. The bad news is dangerous climate change has arrived. The good news is we can prevent it from getting worse. And the latest science tells us that if we bring our carbon emissions down to zero, the planet stops warming up. So look, there is um, a, a pledge on the part of the Biden administration to cut our emissions by a factor of two within the next decade. If we do that, and other countries around the world do that, we can prevent the, the planet from warming beyond a catastrophic three degree Fahrenheit level. And, 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 uh... Now make no mistake, I'm not selling climate change. <laughs> I'm not gonna talk about politics. I don't care about politics. I talk about politics in other places. I'm talking about business. I'm selling solar. The man just said something, that dangerous climate change has arrived. We've been talking about it for a long time, but now we're actually going to do something about it. On January the 20th, two things happened. We pulled out. We pulled out of the Keystone Pipeline, right? That was how we were going to get 
inexpensive fuel to where we need it. Out of the, you know, North Dakota, all that place, we're getting all that fuel. We're going to build it and flood it down to where we need the refineries and get it into cheap gasoline. Uh, and the other thing that happened on January 20th is we re-entered the, the Paris Climate Accord. Who here knows what the big idea of the Paris Climate Accord is? Anybody? Vague idea? What is it? Right, and how do you, what's their main idea? How are they going to get us to stop using fossil fuels? What's that? So that would be the solution, right? But what's the method that they're going to use to almost force us to do it? Carbon taxes, laws against it, prohibitions. They're going to uh, really come down on countries. The United States rejoined the Paris Climate Accord. It was part of the new administration's uh, their cornerstone of, of what they were going to do was uh, enter us into a Green New Deal. And people still don't think that's happened. What well, we all need to realize that it has happened. We are in a Green New Deal. It started on January the 20th, pulled out of the pipeline, put in the, uh, the Climate Accord. The Climate Accord's big idea is to volunteer to charge ourselves massive, massive amounts of tax for using fossil fuels. And the big idea is to stop using fossil fuels. We're going to have, so what this, uh, what that, and if I could get me back to my slides, what Biden said is that we're going to have our fossil fuel output by 2030. That's a massive, that's a massive, massive decrease of fossil fuels. Guys, that's eight years away. We're going to cut them in half, and we're going to eliminate them and get them to zero by 2050. Like, we're going to see 2050. I plan on seeing 2050. Right? That's around the corner. So why am I going on and on about this? And this is something that I talk to my people about every single day. Guys, we're not showing up on a doorstep talking about selling some crap. We're talking about news. We are bringing to the doorstep, to the consumer, information which is new. That was Sunday's news. I've never heard the phrase, dangerous climate change has arrived. California's on fire, Turkey's on fire, all around the world he's fighting. Now, again, I'm not selling climate change. You don't care to know what my opinions are about this particular political issue. Uh, it happens to be convenient for me <laughs> that this is the story of the day and that the globe is seeing this as an existential threat. So I ask uh, people who are 20 years old, what was Paul Revere doing when he was on his horse riding from, you know, through the town from house to house? And they go, who was Paul Revere? <laughs> was, was he just like uh, giving everybody an update? No. He was screaming at the top of his lungs and ringing a bell, trying to get everybody's attention. Hey, everybody, there's an existential threat. The way we live and the things we have are about to change. And he was letting them know that the British were on the shores and they were coming this way. The British are coming. The British are coming. And everything you knew and counted on before is over. So we're facing an existential threat. And the people that we're talking to have no idea. They think that electricity is a little annoying, that it goes up every couple of years. They think, oh, electricity bills. Oh, they, you know what else they think is? Man, I wish these solar guys would quit knocking on my door. <laughs> and I could tell them, you know the best way to get solar guys to quit knocking on your door? Put some solar panels on your roof. They'll all quit knocking on your door. But at any rate, that's uh, what we're really dealing with, guys. We are talking to consumers about something that's going to literally steamroller them and just wipe them out. So uh, in 1960s, the United States realized how much money it was costing for the United States to deal with lung cancer. Have you ever seen the old movies and everybody's smoking in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s? If you tune into a movie, they're all smoking. They're smoking their ass off, right? And then in the 1960s, they say, hold on a second. Smoking is costing us a lot of money, so we want the American public to stop, to stop smoking. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to put a warning label on the side of these, they say, warning, these are killing everybody. And everybody quit smoking. Is that true? Did, how many people quit smoking when they put that label on? I think smoking increased after that. Anybody seen the, the show Mad Men? 
in the show Mad Men, those guys are coming up with the camel commercials and they're having to figure out where to put that warning label on the side and people are smoking with two hands. My mom smoked with one hand and used to hit us in the back seat of the station wagon uh, hitting kids that had no car seats and no seat belts. Right? So times have changed, right? But the government decided we were going to quit smoking cigarettes and did putting the warning label on there help? No. Has it changed much? What's the warning label today? Warning, the polar bears are losing their glaciers. There's no more, there's, we're going to have enough icebergs for polar bears to swim upon. And so we're all like getting into smaller and smaller cars, right? Oh wait, they don't make small cars in the United States of America. They just make SUVs, right? So that's about to change. They are going to stop making combustion engines, uh, literally, also, by the end of the decade. In the next 10 years, you won't be able to go into a car dealership and buy a car that has a combustion engine. Your choices are going to be electric or electric, unless they come up with something new. I love it, by the way, all these people buying electric cars to help out those polar bears. When they plug that into their house, what are they fueling their cars with? They're fueling their cars with coal. I think they just downgraded the planet. <laughs> now they're now they're having coal-powered cars. It's like uh, you know some kind of steamship or something. So you know that's uh, what's happening. But we have stopped smoking. How did we quit smoking? Anybody got an idea why we're not smoking anymore? Taxes. Taxes. How much were cigarettes when you and I were in grade school and our parents were smoking? Uh, a buck. A buck. For me, I'm a little older than you, 60 cents. 60, 80 cents was a pack of cigarettes. My mom used to send me to the store, and they would give a kid a pack of cigarettes at the Circle K. He'd send me to the store with a buck, and I would come home with, uh, I could actually buy a, a sugar daddy, two of them, for 10 cents. It was 80 cents a pack, right? How much do cigarettes cost now at a Circle K? Does anybody here, you know, <laughs> I don't want to ask you. <laughs> if anybody here smokes, don't raise your hand. <laughs> but if you do, you know what they cost, and it's somewhere between $8 and $10 a pack. So when cigarettes went from $0.80 cents a pack to $8 a pack, and now $0.10 cents a pack, you remember in the 80s when we used to like go, you know what they charge for cigarettes in Canada? It's $8 a pack. What are they doing? They were taxing cigarettes to that level then. The United States didn't. Now we do. And now how many people are smoking? Not very many. Kids are what? What are they doing? They're still using nicotine, but what are they doing? They're vaping. Why? Because it's a lot cheaper than buying cigarettes. So anyway, the point of all that is to say that when the government decides they're going to turn a boat around, they have two levers at their disposal. One lever at their disposal is taxes. It's their go-to, right? They just start taxing stuff that they don't like. And I don't know about your market, but if you come to my market and you look at a, a utility bill, you're going to see that 50% of that utility bill is fees, almost all of them federal, some of them state, but it's doubling the cost. A $200 electric bill is $100 in fees. Half of those are carbon taxes that we didn't even know that we had. The Federal uh, Environmental Improvement Fund, the Federal uh, Grid Tax, uh, the other federal grid tax, about half of a bill is federal fees. And then at the bottom of it, when it gets to $2, the bill ends up being two hundred. I'm sorry, two hundred. The bill ends up being two hundred and thirteen dollars. Why is that? Tax on the taxes. Sales taxes on the taxes, and that's what's going on with your current electric bill. Who in here is a homeowner? What's your uh, in what part of the country do you live in? I've got one in uh, Florida and one in Oklahoma. Oklahoma is about six hundred a month. Uh huh. Six hundred a month. Yeah. One in uh, Florida is about two hundred. About 600 a month average, so you're paying about uh, 6000 7000 a year in Oklahoma. And so you're going to run about $70,000 through that meter in the next 10 years. Does that sound about right? Would you be surprised if I told you we're off by a factor of two? Would you be surprised to find out that it's not going to be $70,000? It's going to be $140,000. Why? because the warning label's not working, and we've gotten into the Paris Climate Accord, we're going to drop our emissions by half by doubling the cost of that coal-powered electricity at your home. And home, you did, did, you, did you have an inkling of that? It's 100% true. Just read the Paris Climate Accord. Just read 
are uh, Mr. Biden's, President Biden's idea to have emissions. Their plan, this is not some vague idea of some solar dude, their plan is to double the cost of this product so that we use half. It's a simple, simple equation. In California, we have about 20-30% solar because it's uh, 40 cents a kilowatt hour. In Arizona, it's 16 cents a kilowatt hour. We have 5-10% to solar. In California, it's 40 cents a kilowatt hour, and we have about 30% solar. In Hawaii, they're paying 80 cents a kilowatt, and it's 85% solar. Do you see the correlation? So as the cost of this product, which is called kilowatt hours, sorry guys. So as the cost of this product doubles, and it's been doubling every 60, I'm sorry, over the last 60 years, it's been doubling every single 15 years. So if you go back to the 70s, we were paying two and a half cents. Yeah, anybody here remember their parents calling it the light bill? <laughs> the light bill, $62, and they're yelling at you to shut the lights off, right? Why are you leaving the lights on? You're driving up the light bill, which was 60 bucks, and you're paying $600. Is that for the lights? That's for the energy that it takes to heat and cool your home, plus the lights, plus everything else. By the 80s, we were paying about seven and a half cents. It had tripled. Now, it's been doubling most of the 15 years, but it tripled from two and a half to seven and a half. What happened between the middle of the 70s and the middle of the 80s? We had a crisis. We had an energy crisis. I'm probably one of the few people that remember gas lines and, oh my God, what are we going to do to power our cars? And I started selling solar in 1984, uh, and solar in 1984 was selling solar water heaters which would knock about $12 a month off your bill, but we were, telling, we were selling solar systems to people as the solution to the future of the energy crisis because people just experienced a tripling of what they paid for heating and cooling and electricity, and the government said, hey, we need to start this green, that was Jimmy Carter, he's the one who started the idea of the tax credit. The government pays for a monstrous, huge percentage of a solar system. I wish we had insurance to pay for it, <laughs> but we have, to, we have to rely on the federal government to pay for the solar system. They pay for you, and Jimmy Carter came up with that idea. I was in college in 1984. I had started at a setter. Anybody here ever been a, a setter? Anybody here just been a door knocker going around setting appointments? Were you a setter? Well, You've been a setter. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've been a setter. Jobs go around knocking on doors. You know how we knocked on doors in uh, 1983, 1984? We let our fingers do the walking. Anybody remember that phrase from AT&T, let your fingers do the walking, the yellow pages? Instead of walking around the town shopping, you would use your fingers to do the walking. Well, we used to use our, our fingers to do the dialing, and we set appointments. I was, in the, uh, I was in the telemarketing room in 1984, and I'm smiling and dialing, and I'm saying, hey, we got a guy in the area, we want to show you a solar system. Happened to be a solar water heater, and by the way, the government pays for a monstrous percentage. At the time, Jimmy Carter's tax uh, credit was 50%. <laughs> it was 50%. It was the greatest sale I've ever been on. This thing cost $5,000. The government gives you $2,500. The state of California gives you $1,000. So it's basically free. You get all that money up front, and then we charge you, you know, 30 bucks a month for a water heater for the next, you know, five years or something like that. And the close was, are you stupid? Nope, all right, sign here. Because <laughs> you're going to get all this money and you're going to spend none. Uh, and it, it doesn't make any sense not to do it. Which is essentially the same as the close is today for solar. But in 1984, I was letting my fingers do the walking. and, and, and uh, Which is funny because today I'm out knocking on doors with our setters. And I knock on doors every day. People ask me, you're making seven-figure income in sales? You don't knock on doors anymore. I go, yeah, I knock on doors every day. <laughs> I'm going to show you why because it costs too much not to knock on a door. I'm in three or four appointments every day. I'm selling two or three of those solar systems every day. There's a guy standing across the street holding a hose, watering his grass, and I'm walking out of his neighbor's house, and on my bag I've got a contract for $80,000. I just met them an hour and a half ago, and I just sold them an $80,000 solar system. There's their neighbor across the street holding a hose. 
how much would you have to pay me to not go up and say hello to that guy and hand him a card? So I'm in appointments every single day. I sell two or three solar systems every single day, and I have a habit. And I'm going to talk about habits. The one thing that Lee was talking about was how do you get yourself to do that? I have the answer to that because I'm a lazy guy. Is anyone in this room lazy? I'm a lazy guy. I'm a lazy, undisciplined. If I see a window to just mess around and be lazy and be on a couch or be at Starbucks, I'm going through that window, man. If there's not something in my way, you know, I can talk, especially since I'm such a good salesman, I can, you know, sell enough to not have to, uh, I can cover that time that I'm not working. I spent decades covering the time that I wasn't working by being a good salesman. But back to this, 1984, I'm smiling and dialing, and what's funny is today knocking on doors, um, you really can't telemarket these days, can you? That wasn't really on your list, Lee, was it? Set up a telemarketing operation. You can kind of try it. You can put a call center in Mexico or Costa Rica, but we can't do it anymore because the, the call center guys, the telemarketing guys have screwed that up to a point where there's abject hostility, right? One of the things we want to do in the door-to-door -door world is really up-level it, bring a professionalness to it, bring some honor to it. Sam Taggart talks about that at DVDCon. We want to bring honor to this profession of face-to-face -face marketing. Why? Because the guys who did the telemarketing just scorched earth that you can't do it anymore. There's so many laws you try and do, you're going to get sued in about 15 minutes if you set up a telemarketing thing that actually uses your name in the United States. So. But I'm on the phone, I'm smiling and dialing, and these people are paying, uh, you know, about a nickel for power. And then, so today, I keep going back to this, I keep losing it. So today, we actually now go knock on a door. What are we ringing on when we see, we see that ring doorbell? We hit that ring doorbell, what happens? Their phone rings. So we used to let our fingers do the uh, dialing or do the walking. Now we're letting our legs do the dialing. We walk up to the room, walk up to the door and ring their cell phone. Just a little bit of irony for a guy who started out on the phone in the late 70s and early 80s. So what's happened is over the last 60 years, the cost of this product has doubled every single 15 years. So that it was uh, seven and a half cents then, then it kind of flattened out in 2005, we're sitting there paying uh, about 10 cents a kilowatt. Now in 2021, we're paying about 20 cents a kilowatt. These are national averages. The price is doubling every 15 years. That's just normal inflation. That's nothing to get excited about. It's baked into the cake. You're not bringing anybody news by having a conversation with them about that. However, trying to hit the uh, slide advance and it's not a bit there we go so in Arizona our average price is about 16 cents per kilowatt hour what are we going to be paying 15 years from now given the historical average we'll be over here paying 32 cents a kilowatt hour so if I'm paying three thousand dollars a year in 15 years I'll be paying six thousand dollars a year that's entirely different than what that homeowner is thinking and that's just normal inflation we're not dealing with normal inflation I've been doing this conversation with people for five years and I've never been able to have the conversation I'm able to have with them today the reason to go solar before now is completely gone to a whole nother level and a whole nother gear and that's because of the fact that we're actually dealing with real inflation now. This is the lead story on the news. There's two lead stories on the news this weekend. One of them is dangerous climate change has arrived, and the second one is the kind of inflation we've lived with for 30 years is over. We've been dealing with 2 and 3% inflation, and now we're dealing with 6% inflation, and pray to God that it's temporary. If you have 6% inflation for the next 10 years, like, literally, all bets are off. Like... You know, I don't have a slide for that. <laughs> I, that's like zombie apocalypse, right? I do not have a slide for 6% inflation for 10 years. Hopefully that's not the case. But if we just show somebody what they're going to be paying for the cost of this stuff over the next 15 years, it's going to go from 3000 a year to 6000 a year. Oh, wait. I have a good client of mine who works for the largest uh, electrical company, electrical uh, power company in Arizona, APS. Uh, he's one of the guys that moves power around the grid. He said, Mike, I don't believe in your numbers. I sold him solar. 
And when he told me, he's Mike, I don't buy your numbers. It's weird, I got this appointment and he's from the main electric company. I think, oh my God, I'm gonna get punked here. <laughs> like, is this guy uh, gonna be filming my presentation? We're walking up and taking clients away from them every day. We take 30 years worth of revenue from them in a day. And, and I'm thinking, these guys gotta be pissed, right? I mean, we're just knocking these things off left, right, and center. What's going on here? So I sit down with him, I show him the stuff, and he signs up for solar. And again, I still think I'm being punked. I'm really watching my P's and Q's on my presentation, being really careful to be super accurate uh, with every single thing that I say. And then he and I become friends. I ask him later, you know, I was really expecting you to challenge, and people really have challenged. In a solar presentation, we show people what happens with inflation, and people go, I really don't think this will double in 15 years, but I'll go solar anyway. <laughs> Or, uh, I'm not going to go solar because I don't believe that it's going to double. It's been doubling, you know, every 15 years. I said, dude, what do you really think? How come you didn't push back on the doubling? He says, Mike, we don't think it's going to double. We think your numbers are wrong. Well, why do you think our numbers are wrong? He says, well, I'm involved in the grid. That's what I do. The grid's 100 years old. It has literally no security. That thing where we're worried about North Korea being able to take our grid down, that's not, you know, that's not a, a hoax. Like, we have no security on the grid. That's one of the things we're actually afraid of, that the Russians or the North Koreans could pay some 12-year-old kid to knock the grid down. He said, so we need to add security, and then we have what's called centralized distribution versus uh, distributed generation. The grid that we all use was built for centralized distribution. We have all these power plants fueled by coal, and then we distribute it through the grid down to the neighborhood, one of the things that makes solar such an easy thing to sell is there's an urgency stack like you wouldn't believe. There's always another deadline. There's always another issue that's going to change the deal. When somebody looks at it and says, I want to put this off into the future, the deal we're showing them will not be there in the future. They must act now. That's always the case. We're always showing them about two or three different issues that's going to change the opportunity that we're presenting. There's deadlines on the utilities, deadlines on the tax credits, there's deadlines uh, on how many people can go solar in a given neighborhood. So the current grid, which was built for uh, centralized distribution, can only handle about 15 to 20 percent of the homes being plugged into the grid and selling their power back to the grid, which means after, in Arizona, we have a lid. At 15 percent, no more homes can go solar in that neighborhood. And so at 15%, boom, they can't go solar anymore. So that's one of the, one of the urgency issues. There, here's a newspaper article that says if 15% of the people in your neighborhood go solar, you're left out. Now eventually they will fix that, but that's because the grid was not built for uh, uh, distributed generation. When you have a solar system on your house, you're, you're generating power. More than 50% of the power that you generate gets sold to the electric company. It's a reverse monopoly. Right? And if you live in an area with, uh, with uh, net metering, which is an awesome thing to be able to sell solar with net metering, we lost net metering in Arizona in 2017. They switched to cash metering. Now we have to show people pluses and minuses in cash instead of pluses and minuses in kilowatt hours. So it's very, very different. So in given that, all of those things are changing. The price that the utility pays, the tax credits, all of that stuff is, is going away. But what the consumer is dealing with is, oh, I think I'm gonna stay where I am. What they do not know is that under normal circumstances, that price will double. Given the fact that the grid is not up to date, needs a lot of capital put into it to keep it and get it up to date, that's gonna triple the cost of the power that they're paying over the next 15 years. And we haven't even begun to deal with the real issue. What if we actually, what if this is you know, something related to a new normal with regard to inflation? And, you know, that may or may not be the case. We'll probably have some high inflation, some low inflation. But the thing that is absolutely rock solid is that this is the year, 2021, that the United States started and embarked on the Green New Deal. The idea of the Green New Deal was to, is to eradicate, eradicate fossil fuels uh, by 2050 and have them by 2030. That's going to change what consumers are paying dramatically, and they do not know that. That's not in a solar presentation. What's going to be and show you in the MOD Sales Academy is historical inflation, but also be able to demonstrate to the customer what's more probable than historical, given current inflation, infrastructure updates, and what we're dealing with for real, which is the Green New Deal. And so when people look at those numbers, 
I mean, it's existential for their ability to continue to live in the home that they're in. The nice thing about roofing is that people need it. If someone needs a new roof, they just need a new roof. The bad thing about solar is nobody needs solar. They're already plugged into a grid. Nothing's going away. And they don't actually perceive a problem necessarily. They don't like how much it costs. So what we're teaching people to do in the MOD Sales Academy is to deliver a message that's important. We're actually being of service. When we show up in your door, when I pay for a direct mail piece, when I put something into your Facebook account, uh, I am actually doing a service. I'm bringing you information that if we can't get to you and have you understand it and change the course of the path that you're on, then there's a good chance you're not going to be able to afford to live in this home 10 or 15 years from now. And so that is not going door to door peddling some product that's actually being of service. We're literally like Paul Revere uh, going from going from house to house. Anybody got any questions about that? Anybody experienced, uh, anybody experienced their bill going up in the last, say, 10 years, right? Can anybody kind of anecdotally project that? No, we can't. We can project that. I do project that. We actually show customers what they're paying now. So what, can you imagine showing up on a customer's kitchen table? You've got an appointment to see them. And instead of selling them a product, you start showing them, I, I have a, a new word in my vocabulary, it's called disquisition. <laughs> We've all, who here knows what an inquisition is? Right, that's where somebody gives you the third degree. A disquisition is when somebody does the reverse of an inquisition and reads you the story and reads you the file on you. And can you imagine visiting with somebody and showing them, we see that you've lived in the home since 2016, you paid this much for it, your average, uh, your estimated mortgage was $2,000 a month. You could have rented this same property for maybe about $1,800 a month. It would have saved you $200 a month to be a renter instead of an owner. During that same period of time, your house has gone worth from being worth $300,000 to being worth $450,000. And if you were renting that home today, instead of $1,800, it would be costing you $2,800 or $3,000 a month. If you had taken that money and decided to rent for a little while, you would have missed out on $150,000 worth of equity and you'd now be paying this much more money because rent goes up. And that's really what we're doing is we're visiting with homeowners and we're showing them that in the, in the, uh, that in the, in the scheme of things, currently what they're doing is they're renting. They're renting the equipment that makes their power equipment. If they continue to do that, they're going to end up in a very different position than if they become a, an owner, just like becoming a homeowner. So here they are. They're at 16 cents in Arizona. And over the last 15 years, it's gone from 8 cents to 15 cents. 16 cents. And in the next 15 years, if we don't hit infrastructure issues, if we don't hit extraordinary inflation, if we don't have any effects from a Green New Deal, we're going to go from 16 cents to 32 cents. And what's at the end of that line? The answer at the end of that line is an arrow. Anybody remember geometry? What does it mean when a line has an arrow on the end? It goes forever, doesn't it? So after you rent for 25 years, how much more? When will your rent be paid up? When will you not have to rent anymore? Forever. That line goes on forever, and this is the nice line if it only doubles in 15 years. So this is what the, this is what we're sitting down and showing them. It's a disquisition on their current strategy, which is renting their power equipment, and in 15 years, they're going to end up there and doubling forever. If they go solar, which is ownership, instead of renting, we're going to get their costs down. People look at solar with me all the time. I show them the presentation, and almost to a man, they say, who doesn't do this? Who doesn't do this? And I say, well, I... <laughs> I, I can't, uh, when somebody, and the answer is if, if somebody looks, they almost always do it. If you know how to do this presentation and you know how to close this presentation, most of the people that you sit with will do it except for the ones that want to think about it, which by the way is all of them, right? Part of this program is learning how to take, you know, the 90% of people who look at this and say they want to think about it and move them from thinking about it to doing paperwork in about 15 or 20 minutes. And it's Real easy to do that if you know how. 
Well, what we're suggesting to them is that they change their strategy from renting to owning. They're going to go from a deal that's highly taxed, remember that 13% tax in the end, half of it was fees, uh, and it's going up over time. We're going to move them into solar, and it's less. Why is it less? For number one, it's no, there's no fees. Number two, there's no taxes. And three, the government is subsidizing. Remember we were talking about when the government gets it in their head that you're going to do something, that as a people we're going to do it. They have two levers. One of them is tax. The other is subsidy. So they tax things they don't want, and they subsidize things they do want. Solar is paid for by the federal government at a rate of 26%. That's if you act now. It's dropping soon. The government pays for 26%. If you go from renting to owning, the same thing is going to happen with the utility bill that happens with your home ownership. If you own a house and you have a mortgage, and it's a fixed mortgage, how much would your mortgage have gone up in the next 10 years? Nothing. Nothing. Your mortgage is the same in 10 years. Rent goes up every few years with the market. Can you imagine, in fee is anyone else in a market where the real estate values have gone up by a six-figure dollar amount in the last year? Mm -hmm. Phoenix, Arizona, you put in a, an, a, an offer on a home, and you're gonna be one of 30 offers, and all the rest of them are in cash and more than the asking price. You're not getting the house, right? So the prices are higher, and you can't get it. But if you do, you're going to lock it in, right? You're going to lock it in with a fixed rate mortgage. You're going to come down here, and that fixed rate mortgage means your electric bill is going to be the same in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 25 years. It's never going to go up a dollar. And you'll notice there's no arrow on the end of that line. Why is that? That's because of the fixed rate mortgage that you put the solar system on is going to come to an end date. Right? You're going to make all the payments. <laughs> You're going to make all the payments. And when you reach that end date, what happens to the monthly payment? It goes to zero. And so I'm constantly standing and talking to someone either at their door uh, or sitting at their kitchen table saying, here you are, and in 15 years you're going to be here, but if you go solar, we're going to drop the price because there's no tax and because it's subsidized. And over the next so many period of years, if you spend the same amount of money that you're spending with the electric company, but apply it to a solar loan, in 12 years you'll have your solar loan paid off, and instead of being here, you'll be here. Mr. Customer, would you rather start here and end up here, or would you rather start here and end up at zero? And you'll notice this was not a big movement, right? We're going to take them from 16 cents to 10 cents. And here's what's going on with most of the, so most solar presentations, and there's, you know, a thousand solar guys in the country, and their closing ratio is about 18%. So they get to see as many as they people as they can, they get to the kitchen table, and what they show up and they say is, Mr. Customer, you're spending $180 a month average, or $600 a month average, and if you go solar, because it's subsidized and there's no taxes, you'll be spending $147 a month. And oh look, that's uh, $38 a month less. Would you like to go into $50,000 worth of debt to save $38 a month? Does that sound good? <laughs> Does that sound compelling? If you sign this contract here for 25 years and go $55,000 in debt, we can save you 30, 40, 50, maybe, uh, maybe not usually, $100 a month. Does that sound good? That doesn't sound good. But Mr. Customer, if we were to take the money that we already know you're going to spend in the next 12 years and get off of this strategy and put you onto a strategy of ownership, you're going to arrive at a place that's $100,000 different than if you stay on this strategy. The distance between there and there is typically $100,000. Our customers will say fifty dollars to $100,000 in cash flow, zero down, nothing out of pocket. They don't spend a dollar. We put the solar system up, they still haven't given us a dollar. 60 days later, they've had zero electric bills from the utility company, they still haven't spent a dollar. And then they get their first solar bill. Guess, I can, anybody here know how much that solar bill is? You can answer the question in one word. The solar bill is less. How much does solar cost? to become an owner and end up $100,000 ahead in 20 or 25 years, how much does that cost? It costs nothing. 
out of your pocket and less every month than you're spending right now. That's the answer to what does solar cost. It costs less. So over the next 10 years, you're going to spend a lot less. Instead of putting thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars through that meter, you're going to put a lot less. And we can use that money to pay off a solar loan so that your whole thing ends up here. This we're not trying to save you fifty dollars a month, Mr. Customer. We're trying to get you here, which is to zero. Where we're going to end up with a fixed cost. We're going to have equity in the equipment. That equity is going to transition to our home. We're going to experience appreciation in the home. What we're talking about is using a strategy that makes people rich. Most of the wealth in this country comes from people's equity in their home. And that's because they took money they were going to spend anyway, and instead of applying it to an expense, they applied it to an asset that went up over time, and they paid the monthly payment with money that they were going to spend anyway. And that's the bottom line. They're going to spend the money anyway. And here we have, and here's what happens. People look at that and they go, why does it, why, how come everybody on my street hasn't already done that? And the answer, to, and then what they're really asking me is, this seems too good to be true. Why does it seem too good to be true? <laughs> There's a couple reasons. That's the biggest battle that I have as a solar salesperson, is I'm constantly dealing with people who look at this and they go, I've been told when it seems to be good to be true, something's got to be wrong. And so there's a real good reason, and several of them, why it seems to be too good to be true. Number one, when the government subsidizes stuff, it makes the numbers weird. So it's automatically less because it's subsidized and not taxed. Number two, the energy is free. Number three, this multi-billion dollar corporation is planning to make a ton of money to their shareholders over the next 15, 20, 25 years, and now all of a sudden, they're making nothing. And where is that money going? It's going to their shareholders. They are the shareholders in this electrical enterprise, in this power plant that they've purchased. So that's essentially what's happening, is we're walking up, and for us, it seems too good to be true. The money involved in solar, so a roof is what, you know, 8,000, 10,000, 12, maybe $25,000, how much does a solar system cost? On a low end, $25,000. In, in my market, I'm selling 12,000 watt systems every single day, and those cost about $50,000. And every single day, I have somebody in my company sell a 20 kilowatt system, which is about $100,000. So we're walking up to a door, knocking on the door and saying, hey, you're, you're going to run about 50 grand through this meter in the next 10 years. Can I get you a competitive quote? Is there any chance you'd like to see evidence that perhaps putting 50 grand into this strategy, which you can't call it a strategy, uh, is there any chance we can show you an alternative that over the course of the time you live in your home, I'm not talking about getting you enough money to go to Applebee's one more time a month, right? Save you 50 bucks, right? Take the family to Applebee's. We're talking about when you retire, we're talking about having you be worth 50 to $100,000 more than if you follow this other strategy. And this is really the difference between selling solar and selling another product, is we're actually talking about the ball game that they care about. Where everyone in this room is playing the same game. We're gonna work for 30, 40 plus years, and we're gonna hope to pay our bills, and then have enough money left to go on vacation, and maybe stick three, four, five percent into a 401k, so that when we retire, we're not dead broke on Social Security. That's the ball game. If they were to take the money that they were gonna put into this program over here and move it over here, most people end up, you know, your average family, if they're worth 500,000 to a million dollars at the end of playing that ball game, they've done fantastic, right? If you're worth a million bucks, like, you feel pretty good, right? You're worth a million bucks. We're talking about moving that needle by five to 10% of the whole ball game. We're not trying to save them 50 bucks. We're trying to get them to the finish line. And if you can, you know, pay what? You know, if you pay 13 uh, payments a year instead of 12, you'll pay your house off seven years early. If we can get your house paid off seven years early and start today and get your solar paid off by the same time and you don't have, uh, you don't have a mortgage bill and you don't have an electric bill, you're grocery money away from being good. That's the ball game. 
that's game right there. You got to the finish line, no house payment, no electric bill, and, and you could probably make that social security thing work at that point. <laughs> you can get groceries with social security. So that's really the difference. And this is, guys, this is not what people are selling in the solar presentation. So, you know, I had a, if this thing went out, I probably would have taken a couple different courses. What we've talked about today is the difference between an 18% close rate and closing 70 to 80%. Of course, there's a lot of skills involved in that. The biggest problem that you're going to encounter is that when you get to the finish line, somewhere along the line, the customer's going to say something like, why isn't everybody on the street already have this? <laughs> or they're going to say, oh my God, this is awesome. And they're going to be like, oh my God, I just said that in front of the salesman. <laughs> I just showed my cards that I'm super fired up, I'm super excited, uh, and now the salesman knows I'm a buyer. Almost invariably, the sentence that comes after that is, uh, you're, you're, you're going to email me this proposal, right? Can I, can I have this information? Because this is exciting and I'm going to want to spend a lot of time reviewing it. I'm going to want to spend a lot of time going over it so that I can make an, a, a decision at some point in the future. And that's really where the skills come in. So now we're going to, you know, now you're talking about how are you going to train salespeople to take 90% of these proposals? How are we going to get them in the door? What are they going to say at the kitchen table? And we can simplify that very, very easily and be able, I can train your salespeople how to get that message across in a three minute conversation at the door. Mr. Customer, you're right here paying 16 cents. Now we know this goes up every 15 years and doubles, you're gonna end up here. If you go solar, it's gonna be less. It's gonna be 10 cents instead of 16 cents, but then it's gonna be flat for the next however many years until you pay it off and then it goes to zero. We're talking about showing you numbers that get you to here instead of here, and that's 50 to $100,000 difference than if you stay with the electric company. So here's what I'm gonna do, Mr. Customer. I don't know if you qualify, not everybody has a good roof. I'm gonna to talk to my engineer, have him pull the roof up on a satellite image and see if this house is any good for solar. If you don't qualify, if it's not any good, then we'll call you back and tell you there's no sense in wasting your time. The strategy isn't gonna work for you. But if you do have a decent roof and these numbers are super compelling, then we're gonna to put together a four or five page re uh, report that has all of this information. It's gonna show you exactly how much money you're paying now, and what you'll pay over 25 years. And by the way, I'm sure you don't realize that's over 100. It's over 100 to 200 thousand dollars. I don't know how much, but this proposal, this report, is going to show you exactly what this is going to cost you if you stay on this strategy. If you go solar, it's going to cost you a lot less, and that's because the government is going to make a huge investment into this project because. It helps us get to our clean energy and our, our carbon emission reduction goals. They're gonna put, I would guess in your home, Mr. Customer, I don't know exactly, but somewhere between 10 and $14,000 that you're gonna get from the federal government. So that will also be in the report. You're gonna pay less every month for solar than you do the electric bill. Over the course of time, that's gonna be 50 to $100,000 more in your bank account and your home's gonna go up in value because it costs a lot less money to operate this home over that period of time. When you sell it, the increase in that value, which is appreciation, you're gonna take that with you, and the new guy is gonna be super excited that you spent the last 10 years giving all your electric money to pay down a solar loan rather than handing it to the electric company. He'll be super fired up that he's only got that many years left to pay off his electric bill. So anyway, I'll talk to my engineer. That's right, I know you need to talk to your wife. Go ahead and talk to her. We need you to talk to her, by the way. We'll need her at the meeting. This is a community property state. By the way, let her know we're gonna buy her dinner. And if you, uh, if you had the, the pants on and could make the decision to commission an estimate, I'd be talking about buying you dinner at Outback or uh, Texas Roadhouse. But since she makes the decisions and you need to talk to her, let her know it's gonna be uh, Cheesecake Factory or Olive Garden. Which one does she like better? Cheesecake Factory, let me get that down. Uh, and what's the best email address for us to get the gift card to? Perfect, we'll get the presentation over here. I need two things, an electric bill, and I need to take a picture of your meter. Do your shoes on? Can you come with me? Which side? Is it on this side or it's over on this side? Come on, let's get the pictures that we need to get this thing taken. Perfect, your electric bill, is that on your phone? Pull up APS.com, there you go. There's your electric bill. 
text that over to me. And uh, perfect, everything looks good. We're going to figure out exactly how much money you're going to be more rich when you retire and sell this home. Does that, does that sound good? Now, all we, And here's the other reason why salespeople are out there making their knuckles bloody and not getting anywhere. They're out there selling appointments. Hey, can I come over next Tuesday and take up most of your Tuesday night? You're going to miss Survivor and you probably won't get to eat dinner till 8 or 9 o'clock at night. Does that sound good? No, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> so instead, why don't I talk to my engineer, get all this information figured out. You do nothing. We'll come back after doing all this work, and we're going to show you how you're going to be a lot richer. Does that sound good? By the way, we're going to buy you dinner. Yes, that sounds good. Now that we've already decided that, now that we have all that information, now it's obvious we need a time <laughs> that I'm going to come back and share this information with you. I'm not selling an appointment, now that we've decided this is happening, we need a time for a meeting and we're going to set that meeting. So that's, uh, you know, that's what's happening. We're at that door, we're at that kitchen table, but what's being done at that kitchen table is showing someone how they're going to save 50 bucks a month and do you want to go $50,000 into debt. By the way, solar loans really don't qualify as debt. That's one of the way, one of the things we're going to cover in the academy is how to overcome the objection, this is awesome, I just don't want to go into debt. Debt is what you end up with when you go to Las Vegas and put $15,000 on a credit card and buy all sorts of things you don't want to tell anybody at home about. When you come home and that $15,000 is on your credit card and you don't have an asset to show for it, that's called debt. Damn, Dave Ramsey, not happy with you. When you use other people's money, to acquire an asset that's going to go up over time and you're going to use the money that you had to spend anyway on a bill, that's how rich people get rich. They use other people's money at extremely low interest rates for long periods of time to buy stuff that goes up in price over time. We already discovered that this stuff's going to go from 15 cents to 30 cents if we're lucky. If it goes from 15 cents to 50 cents, that means that what it costs to operate our home over that period of time just went down dramatically, which makes our home worth a lot more. You're going to take that money with you when you leave. So that is the difference between, if you just start to go sell solar, you're going to be talking about, hey, we want to sell your panels and you'll save this much, and how often is that going to work? And they're going to tell you, we want to think about it. You're not uh, going to have necessarily the tools at your disposal. So, you know, the, the closing, when you get to that kitchen table and you've been able to pass this message along and somebody gets it, they get it so hard that they said, holy crap, who doesn't do this? And you say, you know, most people who look at it do it. Uh, it sounds like you're ready to move forward. Uh, yeah, can you email me this proposal? Because we're going to spend a lot of time. Now we're going to talk about, you know, where do we get to from there? to the point where you're walking out of the house literally in 25 minutes with a $55,000 contract ain't signed and done. And that's not, you know, it's not necessarily simple to do, but it's easy, right? It's if you know how to do it. Remember the, uh, remember the uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire game show? Rebus Philbin would be sitting there and the guy would say, uh, who, who's the first president of the United States? And the guy would be like, oh gosh, <laughs> and Abraham Lincoln. No, that's wrong. And you'd be like, how could anybody be that, you know, stupid? And Regis Philbin would say, it's only easy if you know the answer, right? So it's easy to get somebody from that point in a presentation to the next point in the presentation if you know how to do it. What's going to happen in the MOD Sales Academy, which is part of Lee's offering, is your salespeople will be able to sit in training every single day. I'm going to sit with them one-on-one -on -one in this virtual training. They're going to learn how to do this over and over and over again. How did I learn to get from that place to another? I didn't know how to do that. You know who taught me how to do it? In 1984, when I was a setter on that uh, you know, telephone room setting appointments, I, 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 I listened in into the conference room and there was a, a presentation going on to new salespeople. They were being trained on how to sell solar. And they said, just walk them through these slides, and when they get to the end, they're going to love it. And then they're also going to say, they want you to come back on another day. And when they say, we want you to come back on another day, here's what you say. 
Close number one, close number two, here's the Colombo close, here's the today only close, here's the if I could, would you close, and you're just gonna keep pulling each one of these guns out until one of them works, and you're gonna be at the kitchen table until you've gone through those presentations and gone through those closes, and you're signing them up, and if they haven't said, please leave, you're still at the table, and you've got a better than 50% chance of writing this up today. So how did I learn that? I had those guys show me how to do it. You know who they were? They were tin men. They were guys who'd been selling aluminum siding since the 1950s. They knew how to knock on a door, get to the kitchen table, do a compelling presentation about how they were gonna spend a lot less money with a much better product, and when they said they wanted to think about it, they knew the Colombo clothes, and the Today Only clothes, and the If I Could Would You clothes, and the Empty the Clip. One of the things we're gonna learn in this process, and that I'm gonna be able to teach your salespeople, is that the meeting that we're having is not the meeting about the meeting. This is the meeting. The title of this chapter in the academy is called, I'm Not Coming Back. How in the world could you tell a customer that I'm not coming back, this is your only shot at this apple without being offensive? Well, it's easy if you know how to do it. We're gonna walk in the door and we're gonna draw a frame. We're gonna hang a door in that frame and at that moment, we're gonna close the door. That's how we're gonna do it. It's real easy if you know how to do it. I'm literally sitting with every single customer and I tell them that this is the time that I have for you and I'm not coming back. I can't come back, it's not my job to come back. I'm not on the comeback squad. I'm on the squad that comes here and helps you understand this to a point where you say, holy crap, who doesn't do this? That's my job. And then from there to the point where we're doing documents, it's, you know, it's just an old tin man's trick. And uh, those old tin men showed me how to do it, and it works like four out of five times. So if you can do this, if you can get to ten, and, and what happened for me, guys, and I have to share with you, one of the biggest things that I'm going to be sharing with you is the fact that I learned that what my job was to be was to be being told no. That I was actually being paid for someone to say no to me. Not to say yes. If you talk to a hundred people, one of them's gonna say yes and you're gonna get paid. The money isn't for the one guy who says yes, it's for all of the people that you spoke to that said no, this is a job. And if you understand that if you knock on a door and they say no, they're not interested, that you just made, I figured out the math. I knock on about seven doors. I talk to about seven people. It's weird how many times I talk to one people and get one appointment. It happens to me every day because I'm in three or four appointments every single day. The only time I have to knock on doors is in between appointments, and I have a rule. So the primary reason people aren't doing this, and this is what Lee said earlier, is because they're not able to get themselves to do it. I spent 30 years in sales living so far below my potential. I was not a seven-figure income earner the first you know, 25 years in sales. It wasn't until the last 10 years until I found solar when I woke up to the opportunity and I said to myself, holy cow, I'm making $5,400 every time somebody says yes. And that's just a commission plan. That's not like the whole thing. That's just a commission call plan. I'm making $5,400 every time someone says yes. Why the hell am I in three or four of these meetings a week and closing two or three of them when I could be in three or four of these meetings every single day. What's wrong with me? Do I hate money? You know, do I not understand what's going on here? And it was then that I, I really came on to a series of solutions that enabled myself to work at a level where I was in three or four appointments every day. Today I show people how to do that every day. I have people on my team doing that every day. And then this, this high five, this high six figure, seven figure income is not some mythological, you know, unicorn. If you, it's just math. It's not magic. It's just math. I have to talk to about seven people to get one of them to say, sure, I'll take a look. I close on a conservative basis two out of three. So if I'm closing two out of three and I'm making $5,400 a piece, like, Dude, I don't need to like sell many of these in a week to pay all my bills. If I'm working at a rate that's supposed to pay my bills, I'm not gonna be a very successful solar person. How did I go from there to being the most successful solar person in the entire industry? How did I go from selling, you know, maybe three, 400 kilowatts a month to selling three million? 
watts of solar every single solitary year? There's an answer for that. It's a very simple solution. And, and none of it is new, but it's about putting them together and being able to give yourself a daily regimen that starts every single solitary day. I'm on a phone call at 7.15 in the morning. Everyone who's on my team and is part of this program is on this call at 7.15 in the morning. What are we doing? Getting our day started at 7.15 in the morning. One of the best things about being a solar sales rep is that the way it's compensated, you can just get up at noon every single day and knock down 120 grand a year. You're not gonna make 350 or 500 or 750 or a million, but you can start every day at noon and you're probably gonna work every two or three days and you can make a couple, you know, 100, $200,000 a year. So how are you gonna get yourself from there to there? And the, the answer to that is habits. And so one of the things that I'm talking about all of the time is the habits, is the hacks and the skills to get yourself to get that many no's per day. How are you gonna do it? And it's, it's not magic, guys, it's just math. And so it starts at 7.15 every day, it starts out with an accountability call, I call it the Cleaners Club. Here, who, who here has read Tim Grover's book, The um, Relentless? Tim Grover's, what does he call cleaners? So what did, I'm sorry, <laughs> what did he call Michael Jordan and Kobe? Cleaners. cleaners, right? So we have a Cleaners Club every single morning. Every single morning, everybody's got to be on that call or they're not in the cleaners club. But what are we doing? We're starting our day. We're talking about how many no's we got the day before. You know, how many of our, we got this habit. And I, there's a whole series. I call them no matter what habits. I didn't really get to go. So this is the book that's coming out and it's called No Matter What. That's right. I'm not in charge of that, am I? <laughs> I'm not gonna bring you guys through the whole sales presentation because we kinda went through it without it. At the end of the day, guys, at the end of that decade, we had a man on the moon. And that's just the fact of the matter. In the next 10 to 15 years, we're gonna have our emissions and that you're either going to embrace that freight train and get out in front of it or it's gonna run you over, it's gonna run your customer over. We are doing them a vital service. One of the things that I believe is that when I'm sitting in a house with a customer is that for me to help them get over the fear of moving forward today, for me to help them to get onto paper and get this process moving today, that I really am performing a vital service. This is going to run them over. If, and, and if I can get them over that fear that triggers that, hey, what I really want to do is wait one day. Can you come back tomorrow? Come back tomorrow morning, anytime. I just need to sign this after you leave my house and come back, right? I honestly believe that I'm performing a vital service by helping them get over that hump and get on paper. You know who's happy? When you've executed those closes and now we're sitting there doing paperwork? You know, who's, who, you know who's throwing the party in the room? It's the customer. The customer's fired up. They're go, going solar's fun. Going solar's exciting. Thinking about these numbers coming to fruition in your life is exciting. You know who's not happy when they just signed a $55,000 contract and I just made $5,400? I have to do my 1,500th set of these gosh damn documents. <laughs> I gotta spend 20 minutes doing paperwork. I'm like, sometimes I almost wish, maybe, uh, sometimes I almost wish maybe this one will just not go and they'll say Okay, that makes sense. Is this a reasonable plan? Yeah, that's a reasonable plan. Boom We're doing paperwork and they're all happy and I'm like damn I got to do this paperwork again So I honestly believe that we're performing a service salespeople don't feel that way When a customer is telling you they really need a couple days to think about it. They're very very convincing and, and, and the primary idea in all of that whole realm of the I'm not coming back is do not buy the objection. It's bullshit, it's a smokescreen, it's not true, and at the end of the day, the truth of the matter is if you buy the objection and don't get them over that hump, you've let them down. You wanna know the truth of the matter? I'm gonna be in 15 of these presentations in the next four or five days. I don't care, I really don't care. It's gonna affect me for a minute. If you can't muster the guts to pull the trigger, I'm not gonna remember your name in literally 48 hours. When I tell them that I'm not coming back, 
I'm telling them the truth. Anyone here guess why I'm not coming back? You're going to be on another appointment. It's on somebody else's. I'm never going to call them again. When I don't get them to sign and I spend real hard work doing follow-up, one out of ten of them ends up going solar. If I'm in three or four appointments a day and two out of three of them are going solar, let alone four out of four, sometimes I'll say sign ten in a row. If I'm getting four out of five who I've never talked to to move forward, where should I spend my time? On the four or five a day that are able to sign or the one out of ten guys who can't pull the trigger today and probably won't be able to pull the trigger tomorrow. So when I tell them I'm not coming back, it's for two reasons. One, um, I don't think it's worth my time to pursue people who can't make decisions because by the time they're done with my process, if they were sold, they're buying if they're not sold, then they're not sold. Why am I going to spend a bunch of time on people who don't get it? You cannot fix stupid. Right? This is like, who doesn't do this? He's the guy. <laughs> who, who doesn't get this? He's the guy. That's okay. It's not for him. It's not for everybody. But if you understand that this is not the meeting about the meeting, it is the meeting, and that you're providing a vital service by helping this customer get over this fear, get over this concern, procrastination, if you can understand that, you're going to have the ability and the guts to do what it takes today. If we're both sitting at the kitchen table, I figure I still have a better than 50% chance of getting this to happen. If I leave the kitchen table, I know my chances are way less than 1 out of 10 for two reasons. <laughs> one, they're probably not sold. And two, after you've executed that many attempts to close the sale... That walk to the door is pretty awkward. We're not really, we made a friend. When I ask people, I have people that work for me, and they've heard me describe this process a hundred times over five years, and I know damn well that they left that house telling me one more time that they were going to buy on Friday and why they didn't buy last night, but they really, really are going to buy this coming Friday. And I say, did you grab the toolbox out of the, you, you were looking at a nail on the table, and you were looking at a hammer in the toolbox. Did you grab the hammer and hit the nail on the head? And they go, well, I you know they really needed those few extra days. They bought the objection. When you grab that hammer and you hit the nail and it works or doesn't work, it's different. What that person's afraid of is that they feel like they have achieved a rapport. They feel like they have built a relationship and in their mind they think they're going to reserve that rapport. They think they're going to reserve that relationship to utilize later to get them to buy on Friday. They don't understand that that's not going to happen 90, 95% of the time. And so when you do grab the nail by the, <laughs> hit the nail, and you grab the next drill, you grab the screwdriver, and you grab the drill, and you grab it, and you just keep going until, like, you know, they ask you, they don't necessarily have to ask you to leave, but you know when it's time to leave, right? This isn't happening. And then I have another close after that. We're going to close for that other appointment. That's a whole nother, whole nother tactic. But honestly... I've used up every single bit of rapport. There's nothing to come back to. I don't typically call them back because that walk to the door after that's kind of awkward. So, and that's what that guy's afraid of. He doesn't want to pull that nail out because he knows he's going to use up the rapport that he's built. So that's essentially, uh, you know, what we're going to be training the salespeople to do and utilize that on, a, on an every single call basis. And I don't know where Lee is. Are you around, Lee? Who's got questions about solar? Yeah. So uh, with the installs, you, yep. you, you're actually a distributor for a bigger company, or you, you have to like, buy the solar panels and hire the installers? One of the awesome things about the solar business, guys, is that there's absolutely no barrier to entry. You and I could start a solar company this afternoon, and we could have three or four solar deals signed tomorrow which would have made us about 20 grand as salespeople who don't have all that good of a deal, right? So my average salesperson makes $5,400, and that's on a comp plan. That's not some crazy red line, blah, 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 blah. So if you're a, the only barrier to entry to the solar business is being able to sell solar. If you're able to sell solar, there are a dozen companies standing around who have ladders, and they have trucks, and they have contractor's license, they can't sell a solar system to save their life. All right? And so most solar companies go backwards. They, they buy ladders. And they find out where they can get a good price on solar panels. And then they end up selling no solar panels. 
You don't need to build a solar installation company. You can find the titans and the freedoms and the pures of the world. Those guys are lined up five deep because they don't know how to sell solar. And who's going to make the lion's share of the money is you. You're going to make the lion's share of the money. If you then later want to go through the seven-figure capital investment and licensing and bonding and insurance and all of those other things so that you can make the other 15%, 85% of the margin is going to go to the organization that sold it. 15, 20% of the margin is, is going to go to the guys with the ladders. So the real barrier to entry is learning how to sell solar. We can do that tomorrow afternoon. We can walk out this door and get three Nevada Energy customers signed up. We would steal 30 years of Nevada Energy's uh, revenue on that one address and the sales guy would make 5400 and the company would make another 5400 and Nevada Energy would lose 30 years of revenue in a one and a half hour conversation. We talk about why is solar too good to be true? That's why it's too good to be true. There's no barrier to entry. You can knock on a door, get a one and a half hour meeting and walk away with 30 years worth of revenue and get paid commission on 30 years worth of revenue in one day, in one half hour, one and a half hours. So can you give us a, a few of like the misconceptions with, with solar? Because I have a buddy who was actually seriously considering it, and for whatever reason he came to the idea that it's better to house his own batteries and all this, and he didn't want to remodel his house and build a basement and all this stuff. So uh -huh. he decided against it, and you're yeah. talking about staying on the grid and selling back. So when you start talking to people about solar, you find out everybody knows a lot yeah. about solar. <laughs> Unfortunately, all of it is wrong. Right. Everything they know is wrong. It doesn't cost any money to do it. It's going to cash flow positive literally in the very first day, in the first month. They're never going to put a dollar in it. It's going to feed cash to them the whole time they live there. And when they leave, they're going to sell the thing and make a bunch more money again. I don't know what the misconceptions are. I talk to people every day and I haven't found a single person other than they're in the shade that can give me a reason why it makes sense to keep buying energy from the utility company for a lot, lot, lot more. So you stay on the grid. Having the batteries in Always stay on the grid. So it's it, it's the it's the core uh, part of the presentation is where we're explaining to somebody that about 50, 60 percent of the power they make is made at a moment in time where they don't need all that power. Right. right? Solar system makes what it makes. It doesn't make what you need. The utility company. The cool thing about the utility company is they just give you exactly what you need. They don't give you a bunch more and say, "What are you going to do with it?" Solar system gives you a lot more power than you need a lot of the time. And and what do you do with it? It goes through the meter, you sell it to the utility company, and they are bound to buy it from you. It's a reverse monopoly. They have to buy it from you. Most markets have very favorable rates, and so every time you make a kilowatt that you don't need, you sell it. And then, people ask me all the time, Mike, be honest with me. Don't bullshit me. What's the bad part about solar? I said, well, there's two things. One, it sucks at night. <laughs> doesn't do a damn thing. Sits there all night, doesn't make you a penny, does nothing. So you're going to buy all your power from the power company all night. So you have to be tied to the grid. You don't want to be off the grid. This thing where people want a battery to be off the grid, it's fantasy land, it's unproductive, and it's just helping Elon Musk sell batteries. It's, yeah. There's nothing to it. So Elon Musk sells a $12,000 battery, and it holds a teaspoon of power. And if you talk to Tesla or you talk to Sunrun, they're going to try and sell you a battery. And it holds a teaspoon of power and does nothing to save you even 10 cents. All it does is wait for the power to go off, and it keeps your lights on overnight. That's what a $12,000 battery does. Now, I'd love to sell you a battery, and there are utilities that have demand issues, way complicated situation. I'll talk about that in the academy. you learn how to sell to utilities that have demand charges. Then you need a battery because they charge like $20 per unit of increase in demand during the demand period. Now it makes sense to have a battery which you fill up from the grid or the solar in the morning and feed it all back into the afternoon during a really high charge demand period. Then a battery can make sense, but it's literally, it's not gonna get you off the grid. It's just gonna supplement your power during those peak hours. Yes, sir? Solution for the battery, I'm a, I'm a Generac contractor. Yeah, I'd much rather, so, Generac is, I'd much rather go that route. Sell Generacs. Yep. Yeah, and so if somebody, the real reason to get a battery is if you really are concerned. So the only thing it does is it's there for you in case the grid goes down. And then if the grid goes down, now you have a battery, the lights stay on instead of being in the dark. That's the benefit. There's another benefit that's way more important, and that's that when the sun comes up the next day, 
Solar systems don't energize themselves. They need a power source. And so if you, when the sun comes up the next day, it will uh, actually, the battery will run the solar system. And then you can have battery power all night, solar power all day. So if you're talking to someone who has two years worth of food in their basement, or they live in a place where the power goes down a lot, or they're afraid of what happened in Texas this winter where they lost power for you know a week, if you've got a battery, you'll switch right over. But a generator is probably a better, more effective, much more plentiful. How much uh, power comes out of a Generac battery? I mean a Generac uh, generator. As much as you want, right? 